Welcome to Lectures on Priesthood Introduction. I am so excited about this because this is something we've been working on for a long time to actually get into the priesthood portion of the Lectures on Priesthood. So uh, for me personally, this is a an exciting jump off point to get to something that we've been working on for quite a long time now. And what I'd like to do first and foremost is introduce my friend that is here today, Chance Bunker. And uh, Chance, go ahead and say hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having Chance me on. Is, what's that? I'm sorry. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I'm glad you're here with here and, and, and going to talk with you through this. Now, Chance, I'm excited to talk with you because you are young. You're preparing to go on a mission. You're preparing to go um, to the temple for the first time here very shortly. Mm -hmm. We talked, you know, you and I have kind of got to know each other over the last maybe few months, had some really great conversations. Um, one thing about you, I've been so impressed with, I was telling one of my friends, like this chance, you know, you, I feel like I'm talking to like a 35 year old returned missionary <laughs> person who's been to the temple a hundred times and, and talking with you, I forget that you actually haven't been to the temple. And so, you know, I don't know if I want to say congratulations, but boy, I'm impressed at your spirit and your knowledge and your maturity in approaching sacred things. So yeah, thank you. That's, here. A, that's a very nice to hear. Very glad to, to go through this with you. So, you know, feel free to jump in uh, questions, comments. I'm just going to start plowing sure. through it, but this is meant to be conversational to the degree that you feel like you would like to explore some of this and to right. set this up. What I'd like to kind of do is say, this is a, an introduction because what's so hard about this project is that we are covering a vast territory of topics, all of which require a lot of attention and time. And so when you're working with truth, especially in the restored gospel, there are so many different entry points from which you can start to discuss things. And whatever entry point you choose, you by definition exclude all the other entry points. And so it's very hard to talk about one principle without talking about all of them at once. So we're going to do a very high level summary of what future presentations are going to address in depth. So the listener is going to notice very quickly and chance you're going to notice very quickly that we're going to go kind of high level quickly through a lot of different ideas and topics, but just know that we're going to be addressing all of these with in depth in future presentations. So that's my, that's my precursor. All right. Another thing is, is I know a lot of people will listen to these while they're driving and, you know, they'll turn the audio on. They may not realize that critical to understanding what we're really trying to, to talk about is seeing the slides because when we model it in slides, it communicates a lot more. And a number of people said to me, yeah, you know, I, I got, I, I like the presentation. I said, well, did you watch the slides? And they look at the slides and they go, oh my goodness, I missed half of this because the slides are sort of what bring it together. So if the listener can do it, I definitely recommend watching the slides because we're going to, we're going to sort of model things in slide form and pictorial form. That's really going to help um, drive the points together. So having said that, let's begin. We're going to start off with the Bruce Elder Bruce McConkey quote that I love. We've read this in a former presentation. My brethren of the priesthood, to all of you, to all holders of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, I issue this challenge. Come learn the doctrine of the priesthood. Come live as befits one who is a servant of the Lord. This doctrine, this doctrine of the priesthood, unknown in the world and but little known even in the church, cannot be learned out of the scriptures alone. It is not set forth in the sermons and teachings of the prophets and apostles, except in small measure. The doctrine of the priesthood is known only by personal revelation. It comes line upon line and precept upon precept by the power of the Holy Ghost to those who love and serve God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength. Now, I love starting with this because... It's going to suggest to the listener that 
what we're kind of going to be talking about in terms of priesthood doctrine is hopefully a primer for your own spiritual witness and discovery in companionship with the Holy Ghost. I hope that what we talk about will be a framework that can be contained within the current corpus of revealed doctrine, both from restoration prophets and from the scriptures. And we're going to synthesize a number of principles in a way that hopefully will open somebody and expand their understanding and desire to pursue it through the Holy Ghost themselves so that they can have this experience that Elder McConkie is um, talking about. Any thoughts on that quote, Chance? I'll let you jump in if you'd like to. I talk fast, and, and, and yeah. so you're welcome to even cut me off and say, hey, I want to talk about this, so go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting quote. You know, it's a uh, Elder McConkie had a lot to say. <laughs> he sure did, and we're gonna we're gonna lean on him quite a bit, mostly because he just articulated it better than a lot of people I've ever read. So, a love Elder McConkie. Okay, Chance. Now, this we're gonna sort of use this as a uh, as your temple prep in a way because yep. the introduction to the priesthood is the way to think about the centerpiece of the temple endowment. So all of this really is, you know, you, you kind of reached out and said, I, I, you know, I want to prepare for my endowment. And I thought, well, I don't think there's a better way to do it than to walk through the doctrine of the priesthood, because we're going to drive towards this understanding that the temple endowment is priesthood doctrine. It is the centerpiece of priesthood doctrine. So we're going to zoom out. We're going to start from the beginning. You having not, experience the endowment yet you may not know that it does start with adam and eve and so we're going to have the same starting place and we're going to start building out a number of principles that if the listener stays with it they're going to see how all of this builds towards an understanding of what priesthood is sound good yeah sounds good okay so adam and eve they're in the presence of the lord they're in the presence of the tree of life and the fundamental thing that we experience as we all consider ourselves as Adam and Eve is that we go into a separation. And this separation is to be cut off from the tree of life and cut off from the Father. And as Alma says, we are lost forever. We become fallen. And this is the source of our fundamental existential problem that we're cut off from the presence of the Lord. And by virtue of that separation, we move into spiritual death. And this is the singular root of all of the problems we experience, the existential difficulties uh, of who we are, to the pain, the sorrow, the sadness, the difficulty. It's because we are not ourselves and we are not ourselves because we're cut off from the Father. Because of the separation we all experience the fundamental fruit of separation, which is fear. You know, we see Adam and Eve talk about this. Um, they hid themselves because they were afraid. The first fruit of the fall is fear. It's a convenient alliteration, but it's true. If you consider, if you consider an existence where all fear was removed from you, you would almost instantly consider that an, a heavenly type of environment. The way that we are reconnected with heaven is by virtue of a covenant that the Father offers us through the Savior. And it's through this covenant that we reconnect. Now, Chance, when we talk about covenants, we have some pretty standard ways that we talk about them, usually, right? in the church yeah one of those is this obvious two-way promise is you think it's a fair fair statement to say that that's kind of the way we standard standardly think about covenant that's the way i've usually described it yeah it's a two-way promise it's kind of contractual it's not wrong but it's also not really right uh, in the sense that it doesn't fully capture what's happening in the type of covenant that the lord is offering because when the Lord offers a covenant, it's not so much of a two-way promise, but
but it's, you know, in a transactional sense, like you do X, I'll do Y. It is actually the covenant itself is transformational. It's transformational, not transactional. And that transition, transformation actually is the transition of the condition of our very being. And it's the transition or the transformation of the condition of, of who we are that actually puts us into a relationship with the Father and the Son. So we're regaining a relationship through covenant. And the regaining looks something like we are actually transforming us. And that transformation on earth brings us back into the presence of the Father and the Son. So God's true covenant is a power that transforms us on earth. And chance, something I'd, I'd want to immediately start to emphasize is that God's true covenant isn't sort of this promise that you get to go to heaven in the next life. God's true promise or covenant creates this heavenly nature on earth. It establishes heaven on earth. Yeah, I like that. And this is, this is the That's concept great. of Zion. Yeah, we're going to drive towards this quite a bit. So it's not that you get to become a heavenly person when you die. It's be, it, God's true power and covenant when we understand it and how to access it. It reestablishes you as a heavenly person on earth, and it establishes earth. It pulls it down, heaven down, and establishes it here on earth. It is the establishment or the transformation of heaven's nature within you while we're on the earth. And this is really, really significant because the transformation of the soul is the fundamental promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what brings us joy and relief. It's not the hope of a future day so much as it is the experience of the light and truth and knowledge of God in the flesh. And the covenant is complete. The relationship is consummated. We have a fullness of covenant when we regain the presence of the Lord. So covenant is the transition of the condition of your being. And this is why I love, love this verse in Mosiah 27. Would you like to read it? Would it, you feel okay about that? Sure. And the Lord said unto me, Marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people must be born again, yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters. And thus they become new creatures. And unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Any thoughts that strike you? or a spirit of this that strikes you when you read that chance? I mean, I think a lot of, uh, so first of course is, you know, becoming changed. That's important. Uh, I also like the uh, ending of that first verse, uh, becoming his sons and daughters, uh, because it, you know, it sort of highlights that, you know, we're supposed to become like him. Yeah. That's, yeah. that, that's 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 the main takeaway I got from it. And and you know it's not we we become like him because we set the right types of goals and we implement the right types of disciplines and we're able to sort of manufacture ourselves into his image. What this verse is pointing to is that marvel not that there is a great miracle that is bestowed upon those who enter into covenant that they become new creatures because he makes them into new creatures it is a it is a it is the experience of the miracle of redemption and this is at the heart and core of priesthood doctrine interestingly enough which we're going to sort of build out alma 5 
And now I ask of you, on what conditions are they saved? And now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have you spiritually been born of God? Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Jump too fast. And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if you have experienced a change of heart, and if you have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? Behold, are you stripped of pride? I say unto you, if you are not, you are not prepared to meet God. Behold, ye must prepare quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such an one hath not eternal life. So the transition and the condition of your heart being changed and experiencing this covenantal condition of being is fundamental to everything. This is the miracle of the redemption of Christ and the miracle of the new and everlasting covenant. So we ask the question, what is the everlasting covenant? I know this gets asked a lot. And people talk about this quite a bit. So we're going to kind of bake it out from this perspective. So when God offers a covenant and we accept it, we're going to start building some language around this, okay? We're going to call that being called, okay? Like you're called, like called and elect or called and chosen, like many are called that type of language. So whenever God offers a covenant and we say, yes, I would like to take that covenant. I would like to make that covenant means we are called. Now, as we keep the covenant, we become elect or chosen. We produce the fruit of that covenant. We are regaining a relationship. We are being transformed. And finally, when that relationship is completely restored, the covenant becomes everlasting because this is the calling and election made sure. So you're called, then it is elect or chosen, and then it is made sure or it's made everlasting because an everlasting covenant is one that's eternal and unbreakable. Well, I've never thought of it that way. Hmm. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you and whoever is watching this to to contemplate that and to chew on this and to consider the scriptural context in which you read these types of, of terms in the scriptures. So called elect, sure. Joseph Smith says, the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads, which signifies sealing the blessing upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. So it's the everlasting covenant that we appeal to, that we receive from the Lord, that brings that earth and heaven back into a coexistence or an overlap. And it is done through the atonement or the at one meant of Jesus Christ in his sacrifice, reestablishes the tree of life on the earth. And it's the order of the only begotten son in that sacrifice that reunites heaven and earth together. So when we jump to Adam and Eve in the account in Moses, they exclaim, and this is quoted in the endowment you're going to see here pretty soon, Chance. Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression, my eyes are opened. And in this life, I shall have joy. And again in the flesh, I shall see God. This is why Adam blessed his posterity. He wanted to bring them into the presence of God. That's Joseph Smith. So, Sometimes these things hide in plain sight in that Moses 5 verse 10 scripture. Yeah. My eyes are open and in this life I shall have joy and again in the flesh I shall see God. Any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I found that interesting. Uh, I was A lot of suggestions for preparing for the endowment was reading Moses. And uh, after I read that verse, I went to the, uh, I believe it was in Doctrine and Covenants where he talks about uh, Adam actually having that experience. But yeah. I think it's interesting because I've read Moses prior, you know, but I, I overlooked that verse because I think, 
I think a lot of times, you know, we read it and it's like, okay, yeah, that's, that's typical for, you know, people in the scriptures for that to happen to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. It's, some, it's one of those things that, that hides in plain sight. Again, in the flesh, I shall see God. And Joseph was very, very clear about this. He wanted to bring his posterity back into the presence of the Lord. Now, when you have an overlap of heaven and earth, there's sacred space that is established. And we can call that roughly or genuinely a holy of holies. Holy of holies is where heaven and earth overlap. Those who enter into the holy of holies are the high priest or the great high priest is the who did it in the mosaic dispensation. But the high priest is that individual that is able to enter into that sacred space and both possess the reuniting of heaven and earth, both in space and in condition. So let's take at let's take Adam and Eve again back into this kind of way of looking at in this model. They're in the tree of life, they're in the presence of the Lord, and they go through a fall. And in that fall, they are separated from the Father. They're separated from heaven. They're separated from that heavenly presence. They're left alone on the earth, so to speak. And the way that they're reclaimed is the Lord offers a covenant. And we're going to use this model or form of a mountain and unironically a triangle. Okay. <laughs> Harkening to the, the project that we're working on. The mount is the consistent scriptural metaphor and term and model that we, that we actually work through. Like temples are temples are on tops of mountains. Um, so we're going to start using and incorporating the idea of climbing a mount or ascending a mount. You'll see this all through scripture. So Adam and Eve are at the base of the mount. I'm going to read these verses. For verily I say unto you that I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the light and the life of the world, a light that shineth in darkness and darkness comprehendeth it not. I came unto my own, and mine own received me not, but unto as many as received me gave I power to do many miracles and to become the sons of God. He gave them power to become the sons of God. And even unto them that believed on my name gave I power to obtain eternal life. And even so I have sent mine everlasting covenant into the world to be a light to the world and to be a standard for my people and for the Gentiles to seek it and to be a messenger before my face, to prepare the way before me. Wherefore, come, un, come ye unto it, and with him that cometh, I will reason as with men in days of old. Now, what we're going to see now is a pattern that started with Adam and Eve and their posterity, and he is going to reveal in these last days the same pattern and the same invitation of the new and everlasting covenant as he did with, in men, with men in days of old. So ascending back into the presence is the fulfillment of the everlasting covenant. You do so after following and entering into the order of the only begotten son. Blessed be the name of God for because of my transgression, my eyes are open and in this life I shall have joy and again in the flesh I shall see God. For emphasis, we're reading this again. <laughs> so he brings Abel, and Abel fulfills that pattern. Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. And this is the genealogy of the sons of Adam, who was the son of God, with whom God himself conversed. So we're picking up on things that we might read through very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing how it all points to this singular phenomenal miracle that is the invitation of the new and everlasting covenant to ascend back. So the pattern of prophets, the pattern from starting from Adam and Eve is to become high priests and priestesses. And they are those men and women 
who obtain the presence of the Lord in this life. That is what a high priest and a priestess is. It's someone who enters into the Holy of Holies. These are all of the prophets of the scriptures who manifest this pattern. And when we read them, we can learn the pattern, we can learn the sacrifices, we can learn the principles and the doctrine, starting with Adam, and as recent as the, as the opening of this new dispensation by this dispensational head, Joseph Smith Jr., who reintroduced the new and everlasting covenant and the doctrine of this, of this, of this covenant. So Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaleel, I never say his name right, Jared, Enoch. Now when Enoch comes into this covenant, he brings a people with him, or at least we have the first record of a people going with him. And he brings all of those people into the new and everlasting covenant. Those who come into this place, he says, these are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of Enoch and of the firstborn. So it's called the church of Enoch um, in its timeline of order because he's the first to bring a posterity or a group with him into that structure. And our priests of the most high and after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten son. So you have these, we are introduced to this idea that the order of the only begotten son, he goes first. He is the great high priest. Then the order of Enoch is Enoch coming to that structure, bringing those with him. And then Melchizedek does the same thing. Next we have Jared, Lamech, Noah, Melchizedek. Let's see here. Well, Chance, we're going very quickly, and we're establishing that there's this pattern of Adam and his posterity ascending back into the presence of the Lord. And this is after the order of the Son of God. Anything at this point, you're welcome to jump in, and um, we can talk about any of these things so far, or we can keep going. Anything that strikes you at this point? I've just I've just got a question because I see like with the way this is going, um, will you at all be talking about like the three different parts of priesthood? Like, uh, Joseph Smith said there was you know, Aaronic, Melchizedek, and and patriarchal. Is that going to be covered at all? Yeah, we're definitely going to get into that. Cool. Absolutely. So yeah, we're going to kind of start as high level as we can, and then we're going to just start driving down. And over time, we're going we're gonna to move through all of that. So, you know, at the end of this project, hopefully we have a, a really, really comprehensive understanding, reconciliation and synthesis of everything we've been taught about priesthood. And we can bring it hopefully into one great whole. So, yes. Okay, so Melchizedek works miracles. And in Genesis 14, in the JST, it's one of the best scriptures we have on the principle of priesthood. So why don't, I think it's, I think we can, we should read a portion of it here and it'll start to frame out more of what we're driving towards. Would you like to jump in and read this chance? Sure. Now, Melchizedek was a man of faith who wrought righteousness and thus having been approved of God, he was ordained a high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, it being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. And it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that every one being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith, to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up the waters, to turn them out of their course. And now Melchizedek was a priest of this order. Therefore he obtained peace in Salem, 
and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from earth, having reserved it unto the latter days of, or the end of the world. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah, that's some pretty deep stuff. It really is. But, you know, as we're kind of building this out, we're isolating this, this concept that there is an order. Um, and it's the order of those who come into the presence of the Lord. Enoch does this. And then Melchizedek follows in that order and fulfills it as well. And both Enoch and Melchizedek bring a people with them into that structure. And that's why we, at different times, name the priesthood after them because they fulfilled that order of the Son of God. Yeah, I had not known before that uh, Melchizedek did it with the people too. I thought it was just him. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe this is what it means to be a prince of peace. Is that um, is that they that they're able to do this thing for a people. So we're going to identify all, also that this order is delivered by the calling of the Lord's voice, the Father's voice, according to His will. And we're going to be touching about that quite a bit because the order that Melchizedek and Enoch, and this is referring to, is what Joseph Smith would call the fullness of the priesthood. And the fullness of the priesthood is this power uh, over the elements that it's talking about and obtaining heaven. And so when we fulfill the priesthood order or the fullness of the new and everlasting covenant, those are the great and marvelous blessings of the fulfillment of all of it. So we're going to drive towards that. So a high priest is entering into this place. So the process of ascension into the presence of the Lord is the same process of becoming a high priest. And the DNC, we have some insight into this. And Section 77, what are we to understand by sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? Answer, we are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests, ordained unto the holy order of God, to administer the everlasting gospel. For they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth, to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. And that's a, that's a, um, a principle that we're going to also be introduced to and talk about very quickly. So Melchizedek fulfills this, and he brings a people with him. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of Enoch and of the firstborn. And now they're after the order of Melchizedek. So we have that to add now to our mountain, okay? Now, Abraham comes along in the wake of Melchizedek. Abraham goes to Melchizedek to obtain a priesthood. And Abraham delivers it to Isaac and the pattern to Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel, and he obtains the blessing to deliver this covenant to his entire family, the house of Israel in the 12 tribes, right? Mm -hmm. And this is when we, we received the cut. And this is, there's a lot to talk about here, but we're going very, very high level. This is when the, the new and everlasting covenant is offered to the family of Jacob or the house of Israel to do the same thing. Now we Jump way down the road to Moses, okay? Can I say something real quick? Yes, of course. I can sort of see now why, like, uh, it, it mentions that, you know, those who, uh, you know, are baptized and all that become the seed of Abraham and house of Israel. It's, it's starting to connect. There, there. you go. You're, hopefully these connections start popping everywhere. Because yeah, it'll I bring... didn't make connection before. Yeah, it'll bring everything into focus, right? All these things will start to make sense when we see this grand model or this grand pattern. So Moses is sent to the children of Israel. Now they're in Egypt at this point, right? We're, we're going over hundreds of years of history very fast, right? Yeah. And Moses 
um, you know, he rescues the children of Israel from Egypt. But, but in order to do that, he also went into the presence of the Lord. This is when you get Moses one. And this is where we jump into DNC 84 that Joseph Smith reveals and starts to unveil the priesthood from the perspective of what happened to Moses, who's also falling in this pattern. And this is where we get DNC 84. DNC 84 cannot be understood unless we understand what's happening to Moses. Like the, all that doctrine is contextualized within the framework of what was happening to the children of Israel and what Moses was trying to do. So in verse 19, we get this language, this, this being laid out. And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Verse 20 through 21, therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. So we're going to start building out this mountain a little bit more. And this greater priesthood administereth the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Okay. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. We just read this, didn't we? Mm -hmm. I'm going to edit that part out. Okay. Uh, so it, I'll ask a question once you get to the part that's actually going to be included. So let's go. Let's manifest. Um, we're going to, sorry, let me find a starting point. <laughs> going to have to edit that out. In the ordinances of the, of the greater priest, the power of godliness is manifest. The greater priest is that order that brings you into the presence of the Lord. This is why. Could I, could I ask about, uh, so when it says uh, the ordinances thereof, which ordinances specifically is it talking about? Is it talking about like baptism, confirmation, sacrament, stuff like that? Or is it like, is it talking about like being ordained to the priesthood? What, what is it talking about in particular? Okay, so this is such a great question, and we're going to now we're going to start to introduce that very shortly. So, cool. the ordinances of the priesthood is going to be a major pillar conversation that we're going to have in this overall project. So, you, you're asking the perfect question. The ordinances of the priesthood are the transition points in the offering of the covenant that actually, depending on which ordinance it is is preparing us or bringing us into the presence of the Lord. So when you go and receive your endowment, and we're going to get to this pretty soon, the, the, the endowment is going to give you a pattern or a dramatization of entering into that presence. The priesthood itself is the order of those who go into the presence. So we're going to talk a lot about baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, um, and the other ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood that are all central point to this singular experience and path. Okay. So I know I'm not answering your question, but we're going to drive towards your question because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. We have to get to it. Something that I've always wondered when I've read that verse, because yeah, well, hopefully we're going to unwrap a lot of DNC 84 throughout this, this project. Great. There's a lot to work on. It's, it's, it's very difficult to answer it quickly because there's so much that we have to sort of pull together into one singular model so we can look at it and start to understand it. Now, the key of knowledge of God and the mysteries of the kingdom is the path and the requirement that we travail and tra I'm sorry, traverse to the presence. And we're going to, of course, unwrap that as well. So the key of the knowledge of God is through this order of Melchizedek priesthood and the reception of the mysteries of the kingdom is the path into that presence. So the greater priesthood is the capacitating power, order, and path into the presence of the Lord. Okay, verse 22. Without this, the power of godliness. No man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. 
Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. Could it be any more direct and clear? <laughs> he is going through I, the I, same I, pattern of Enoch and Melchizedek. Yep. DNC 84 is phenomenal, isn't it? No, it's, it's, uh, they had, you know, I've read it before, but, you know, they had me read it before I got ordained just last month to the, to be an elder. And it's, uh, it is, I learn something new every time I read it. Yeah, it's worth a lifetime of focus and study and meditation. Verse 24 But they, the children of Israel, hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence, the Lord's presence. Therefore, the Lord, in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness. Now, here's the key, Chance. This is really critical to grab this key when it's given, okay? Mm hmm which rest is the fullness of his glory. He now gives us a definition of rest. It's the fullness of his glory in mortality. Okay, you see that? They should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Now you can take that key and you can go to the Book of Mormon and you can read like in Jacob, chapters 1 and 2 in Alma 13, where it talks about the rest of the Lord. And now we have a key to unlock those chapters, what Jacob's talking about in Alma 13. So he brings them to the base of the mount. He desires to take them up. They fear. They won't go up the mount. They will not traverse the path of the greater priesthood order. They will not fulfill that order. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also. So, it is withdrawn the mysteries and the knowledge and the pattern and order and the invitation into the presence. The order of Melchizedek and the order of Enoch is no longer available to them collectively uh, as a people, as a covenant people. The everlasting covenant is removed as a covenantal invitation to a collective group of priesthood on the earth. Greater priesthood option is, is removed collectively. So the mount then becomes something remarkably different. We're gonna we're gonna sort of express this using dotted lines. And this and is the lesser priesthood. Go ahead, yes. Um, so when he takes the you know the invitation away, is that like do you think that was like permanent, or do you think that if they had repented that he would have allowed it back? This is a really great question, okay? And I believe, I'm going to give you my opinion on it. I believe that the 40 years of them wandering in the wilderness for that first generation was sort of space that was given to them that they could reclaim it if they kept the law and exercised faith and repented. That the promised land is actually the top of the mountain. That's the promised land. Interesting. That's the tree of life. And the law of Moses was given to them. It didn't have salvation in and of itself, but it had salvation, salvific power because it could, it could focus their minds through a pattern given to them, a structure that could turn them to Christ. This is how Lehi and Nephi used the law of Moses. They talk about this quite a bit, right? In the mm -hmm. Book of Mormon, that they kept the law of Moses because it, it focused them on Christ. Okay. Yeah. And and all of those prophets were able to obtain Melchizedek priesthood because they understood what the Moab Moses was doing for them. And they were able to gather the faith to obtain it directly from heaven, as was taught in Genesis 14 of the JST. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, huh? no, I, uh, I just want to share something real quick. That's one of the things that I noticed when I started, you know, when I actually like understood that part of 84, Doctrine and Covenants 84, was that it's sort of that uh like that the priesthood sort of being take away taken away sort of that isn't that sort of what happens to the lamanites yeah they so, their hearts and they were cut off from the presence of the lord yeah you'll see this pattern yeah you're you're really astute to like start to see this everywhere um 
we're going to have a separate discussion about this because it's worth laying out this principle that during the Mosaic dispensation, which could be marked from, you know, the, what we just read, the priesthood being removed from the children of Israel. Now they have the law of Moses up until when Christ comes and fulfills that law, right? That whole yeah. period of time. Yeah. During that period of time, we have, consider this, consider Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, um, Lehi, Nephi, Mosiah, King Benjamin, Jacob. Um, think of Nephi, that's in Helaman 10. All of these prophets obtained the fullness of the priesthood, Melchizedek priesthood, during the law of Moses. And the way that they obtained it, Joseph Smith said, was from directly from heaven itself. Interesting. So, yeah, so when Nephi and Lehi are in, in the Americas, they are they are fulfilling all of those patterns. You'll even see Jacob say, hey, let's not bring upon ourselves the same condemnation again that the children of Israel did during Moses' time. Let us go on and have a perfect faith in Christ, receive a, a perfect knowledge of Christ and obtain the rest of the Lord. He actually uses all this language. Jacob does. Wow. Yeah. So as a side note, this is why I think it's just, it, it's, it's kind of insane that people say, hey, don't look beyond the mark and seek out to have your calling and election made sure. That's what Jacob warns. It's like, no, you don't understand Jacob. Jacob is saying you are looking beyond the mark by not seeking to have a perfect knowledge of Christ and to obtain the fullness of the presence of the Lord in the flesh. It's the inverse. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And we'll, we'll I keep saying this over and over. We'll, we'll be talking about that more. Yeah, so cool. Moses, what they do is they get and they get what they call the lesser priesthood. And it's a preparatory priesthood, meaning it's given the forms. These outward patterns are forms that will, if you pay attention, will teach you about the real thing. And that's what the lesser priesthood does. Is the lesser priesthood is the exercise of drama, of forms, of outward ordinances. And those outward ordinances have tremendous power if we understand their purpose and their teaching. They can give us the forms of obtaining the real thing. So the preparatory forms are the patterns of how to enter into the presence of the Lord in mortality. This is why like baptism is so, so important that we preserve the form of immersion because it teaches us that in order to be born again, we must be completely immersed, our heart, mind, our body, everything, in following the Lord and repenting of all of our sins so that we can arise from the water, a new creature, a new person in the death of the old self. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, it's, it's pretty crazy how, you know, the book of Mormon emphasizes the importance of like immersion. And I notice a lot of people, like when I go help out the missionaries uh, with uh, investigators, they're like, well, why does it matter so much with immersion rather than like sprinkling or something like that? Yeah. It really goes to show, like with what you just demonstrated, there's so much symbolism with immersion baptism. Yeah. It's like this is why, like, we <laughs> hear a new interpretation every, like, every week, every basically. time, every time. Yeah. Like, this is why I think it's funny when people say, yeah, becoming born again is this lost, this long, slow, imperceptible process. And it's like, well, do you think baptism is long and slow, imperceptible? It's kind of like wading into the water one toe at a time. It's like, no, the pattern is given to you to fully, completely immerse yourself. And that will, that is your baptism of both water and spirit. Yeah, that makes me think of uh, that part in Moroni where it's like, you need to give like, I forgot what it was specifically. I'm probably butchering it, but it's like, give like all your heart and mind to God and for his grace and all that. Yes, that's right. With all of your heart, might, mind, and strength. That's the principle of immersion. You're, you're dead right. Like, Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's really good. Hey, so physical ordinances without the power of godliness is the lesser priesthood. So do you see that delineation? Yeah, yeah. Now I see it. If we don't move from the forms to the power, we don't receive the fullness of the gospel and mortality. So it's not good enough just to have physical outward ordinances, even though that they're they're critical and commanded. We must have the spiritual revelatory aspect or power of those ordinances as well. 
Melchizedek priesthood ordinances are that are the forms and not the power are still a lesser priesthood ordinance. Now, this is a really unique way of looking at this, but I think it's very helpful. So what this means is the temple endowment is a Melchizedek priesthood ordinance. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the endowment, if you're not reading, if you're not actually in reality, receiving the actual thing that the endowment is presenting, then you're only receiving the lesser portion of that ordinance. So in a way, we can do and enact Melchizedek priesthood ordinances within the lesser priesthood, so to speak, if you don't have the actual revelatory aspect. So one example of this is when Brigham, when Joseph Smith says, a baptism without the baptism of spirit, is we might as well ba baptize a bag of sand, right? He says it's not sufficient. That's, 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 teaching this principle that you have to have both the spiritual aspect and the physical within the, within the Melchizedek priesthood to have a full and complete ordinance. So this is why in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest because you don't have a full Melchizedek priesthood ordinance until the, until the power of godliness is manifest. Yeah. Does that make no, sense? Yeah. No, something that I noticed too was like, it talks about like, you know, still the lesser, when they had the lesser priesthood, it's like the gospel of repentance and baptism. But what yes. it doesn't mean is like confirmation for the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's the, the crossover into the Melchizedek. Yep. The Aaronic priesthood can give you the, the water baptism. The Aaronic priesthood cannot give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's a Melchizedek priesthood ordinance. It's a crossover from the lesser to the, to the, to the greater priesthood, actually. That ordinance does. Lot to unwrap there, isn't there? It is, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense when you uh, put it all together. So this Mosiah 13 is a great scripture that that um, puts an exclamation mark on the point we're making. And now I say unto you that it was expedient that there should be a law given to the children of Israel, yea, even a very strict law, for they were a stiff-necked people, quick to do iniquity, slow to remember the Lord their God. Therefore there was a law given them, Yea, a law of performances and of ordinances, a law which they were to observe strictly from day to day to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards him. But behold, I say unto you that all these things were types of things to come. The law of Moses was given to them as a, to keep them focused, obedient, and hopefully would give them a model of something they could look at that would help them get the real thing. Now, in the ancient temple, you'll see that the high priest was the only one allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. The people were um, that weren't of the, were not Levites or of the priestly class were not allowed. They were restricted from this in the law of Moses. In a future presentation, we're going to go through this more, but we want to set up that this is the basic fundamental structure of our modern temple and the pattern that the high priest goes into the holy the holy place and then the holy of holies this is the same structure that we are driving towards in our own endowment of becoming high priests and priestesses everyone that they too can enter into the holy of holies everyone is invited through jesus christ and the atonement of jesus christ it, uh so i saw a um interesting video and I, yeah i won't I won't spoil it because you might be going towards that, but there's a really good video put out by a book of Mormon central that shows how that, you know, pattern of the entering into the Holy of Holies that you just showed uh, is actually the, is actually used in, uh, in second Nephi 31 and 32, the doctrine of Christ chapters. That's exactly right. We're going to, we're just about to get to it. That's perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We're going to, we're just about to, to unwrap that. So Joseph Smith says the reason why the Jews were scattered and their house left unto them desolate was because they refused to be gathered that the fullness of the priesthood might be revealed among them, which never can be done, but by the gathering of the people. So the gathering of Israel is not just missionary work in the sense that we're used to and gathering them into the church. The gathering of Israel is actually gathering them to the presence of the Lord. To the top of the mount. This is why Moses is restoring the key of the gathering of Israel.
Joseph Smith says, all priesthood is Melchizedek, but there are different portions or degrees of it. That portion which brought Moses to speak with God face to face was taken away, but that which brought the ministry of angels remained. All the prophets had the Melchizedek priesthood and was ordained by God himself. This is back to that question we said of all these prophets between Moses and Christ, like Isaiah, you know, for example, they were ordained by God himself. So God never withholds a blessing to any individual if the covenant body is not able to endow or bestow a fullness of the new and everlasting covenant. The Lord will always provide. So Joseph Smith in the restoration finds himself in the same posture, in the same place as the ancients. He restores the fullness of the new and everlasting covenant and the doctrine of it in the same way as Adam and Abraham, Isaac, Melchizedek, Jacob, Moses, all the greats. They come into a sort of a synchronicity of pattern. And Joseph Smith desires, as Moses did, to ascend into the top of the mount, into the fullness of the priesthood, to restore the fullness of the gospel, which is the calling and the election being able to make it sure. The fullness of the priesthood, which is a term we don't really use anymore, but Joseph used it liberally, meaning the fullness of the presence of the Lord. This is also the process of obtaining and establishing Zion. Back to Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 2. Yea, the word of the Lord concerning his church, established in the last days for the restoration of his people, as he has spoken by the mouth of his prophets, and for the gathering of his saints to stand upon Mount Zion, which shall be the city of New Jerusalem. So do you see how the mountain is ever-present in all of these patterns? Oh, yeah, no. Like uh, on Sunday... I, just this last Sunday, I gave a talk about um, eternal truth and knowledge, and I used the example of the brother of Jared, and what he did is, you know, he took the stones he made to a mountain to pray about it, Yep. and that's where he had his experience, and he, same with Moses, I believe same with Enoch, right? Excellent. You're Exactly. You're acknowledging, you're, you're, you're identifying the same pattern over and over and over again. And brother then of course, Jared is one of the best, yeah. Well, mountain what's that yeah i mean the, a mountain is also symbolic of a temple i've heard that's right vice- that's exactly right so these things are all coming together aren't they the temple is the mountain um amongst other things verse five for verily this generation shall not all pass away until in house a temple shall be built unto the lord and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. So that's the purpose of a temple, mm-hmm. is to move through this pattern and obtain the presence, the Holy of Holies, the cross-section, the overlap of heaven and earth meets in a temple. BNC 76. These are they who are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. These are they who have come to an innumerable innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of Enoch and of the firstborn. Mount Zion. So what is the everlasting covenant? It is the covenant and promise of eternal life. It is intended to be received in its fullness in mortality. It is to come into the presence of God while in the flesh. We receive this covenant through the process of receiving the order of the priesthood. So the process of receiving the priesthood is the same process as coming back into his presence in mortality. Okay, so this is a a concept that we really want to emphasize. We're we're belaboring at length, right? Mm -hmm. Ascending in the priesthood is fulfilling the order of coming into the Holy of Holies as a high priest or a priestess. It's obtaining that covenantal status and condition. 
Okay. So what is priesthood? Priesthood is an order. And an order fulfills a pattern. So what is a high priest and a priestess? Just to belabor this more. It is the order and pattern. The priesthood is the order and the pattern of becoming a high priest and priestess. So now we're going to kind of point our minds to Joseph Smith and what he was doing for women, because it's the same thing. Men are high priests and women are high priestesses. Bathsheba Smith, who's I think the second Relief Society president, reports, records, I never like to hear a sermon without hearing something of the prophet, for he gave us everything, every order of the priesthood. He said he had given the sisters instructions, and he wanted to make us, as the women were in Paul's day, a kingdom of priestesses. that powerful yeah that is here's the uh release society uh, minutes in nauvoo president joseph smith arose spoke of the organization of the society all must act in concert or nothing can be done that the society should move according to the ancient priesthood hence there should be a select society separate from all the evils of the world choice virtuous and holy said he was going to make of this society a kingdom of priests as in Enoch's day, as in Paul's day. You see the same pattern revealed to Joseph? Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was wondering, I was wondering uh, if you're going to, uh, at some point, you know, make sure to like clarify between like what priesthood is and what priesthood offices are. Because I feel like people think priesthood is just offices. We're like, absolutely, absolutely driving towards that. Okay, okay cool. <laughs> 100 percent. that's a great question i, feel like I love having you on here because you're those you're, quotes you're asking the, what are you what, no you're asking the right questions the because you see that there's obvious questions that have to be answered as we move through this like and and i believe there's i believe the truth is always more exhilarating and never disappoints so we'll we'll drive towards it so the priesthood is in order and it is the pattern of becoming a high priest how does a man and woman become a high priest and priestess it are those individuals who fulfill the pattern of coming into the presence of the Lord in mortality. This is what Alma 13 is about. We're not going to read it here. Genesis 14, JST, which we wrote an excerpt from, and then DNC 84, which we've written some. All three of these um, chapters harmonize to establish this principle, eternal principle of the new and everlasting covenant and priesthood. Yeah, I think that like in the case of Alma 13, for example... When it talks about like when people read the rest of the Lord, first, I don't think, you know, a lot of people have made that connection to uh, Doctrine and Covenants 84. Right. And I also think a lot of us, you know, we think rest, like we compare that to death. Right. Like we think, oh, you know, I'm finally going to rest. Right. So I think that's, you know, that might be where like people like get confused about the importance of doing this stuff in this life. Rather that's than exactly right. Now. Your point is perfect, and you may not understand what I'm about to say because you haven't been to the temple yet, but those who are endowed listening to this will, that when you go to the veil of the temple in the presentation of the endowment, it does not represent your death. It represents the presence of the Lord in mortality. That's a big game changer for a lot of people to understand that, that when they go to the temple and veil, it's not representing their passing from this life. Wow. So let's go back and hearken to Moses a little bit. Recall that in Exodus, it says, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That was the invitation to the children of Israel to ascend the mount, that there'll be a kingdom of priests. George Albert Smith. Among the first principles that were revealed to the children of men in the last days was the gathering. The first revelations that were given to the church were to command them to gather and send elders to seek out a place for the gathering of the saints. What is the gathering for? Why was it that the Savior wished the children of Israel to gather together? It was that they might become united and provide a place wherein he could reveal unto them 
keys which have been hid from before the foundation of the world, that he could unfold unto them the laws of exaltation and make them a kingdom of priests, even the whole people, and exalt them to thrones and dominions in the celestial world. Again, this pattern of making a kingdom of priests and priestesses. Here's other minutes from the Relief Society that's a little bit different, but similar. All must act in concert or nothing can be done and should move according to the ancient priesthood. Hence, the saints should be a select people separate from all the evils of the world, choice, virtuous, and holy. The Lord was going to make of the church of Jesus Christ a kingdom of priests, a holy people, a chosen generation, as in Enoch's day, having all the gifts as illustrated to the church in Paul's epistle and teachings to the churches in his day. See how this is all coming together? with joseph smith absolutely yeah melchizedek enoch the priest he's the pattern of moses he really is the modern moses the american moses um, yeah joseph smith you know i think it's you know a lot of people they say that's you know brigham young because of the exodus and you know i'm yeah if you read Brigham young he he desired the same things yes uh, but really you know that was like when you read the doctrine and covenants it's all about establishing zion establishing zion and the Lord saying, "You did not. You need to not do what you were supposed to do." Right. Exactly. That's what, that's what it's all about. Aren't all these things coming into focus now that you're like rehearsing in your mind these different scriptures you've studied? Yeah. Yeah. No. Now it's like, whoa! It's this big narrative. It's huge. It's a huge, uh, yeah, huge, consistent, all-encompassing narrative. Exactly. Yeah. Like straight. I'm not kidding. Like you can see the connections. Like it's almost like a linear story from genesis to the doctrine and covenants it's crazy yes and we're going to synthesize all of it right that's that's the beauty of it i'm so glad you're seeing this okay so priesthood is an order remember an order is a pattern how does a man and woman become a high priest and priestess well they must learn and fulfill that pattern i know it sounds weird that we're being so redundant about something simple but this is a very u- a unique way of thinking about priesthood that priesthood itself is fulfilling the pattern of that order. For men, this is to your question, Chance, ordination is only part of the initiation into the pattern that they must fulfill, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of touch on that. So where do we learn the patterns of receiving priesthood? This has all been like one big preamble for your temple prep, Chance. Okay. <laughs> this is the preamble. <laughs> Where do we learn the patterns of receiving the priesthood? The temple priesthood endowment. When you receive your endowment, you're receiving a temple priesthood endowment. In other words, you're going to be given the order of the priesthood. We look in the scriptures. Like we've been talking about this whole time. We identify all of these scriptural patterns, just like you did with the brother of Jared. You know, you not you you immediately saw that, didn't you? Yeah. Lehi and Nephi's dreams, as you brought up that Book of Mormon Central was talking about. So people will say, Hey, where's the endowment in the scriptures? It's like, well, it's like in the first few chapters. As soon as you have Lehi having a vision, you are having an endowment. Yeah, like a I feel like I heard this from you, but uh, I heard it somewhere. It's not my original thought, but I heard somebody say um, that the endowment is really a ritualization of what you can find in the scriptures. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So, in the endowment, you're going to experience um, a ritualization of a of, of traversing a path and it starts in the telestial kingdom and you'll move through the terrestrial kingdom and into the celestial kingdom. This is your, this is the presentation of the endowment that you're preparing to go receive and experience that ter- telestial, terrestrial and celestial is also the ascension of a condition of being. And this is something that we're going to introduce. We talked about in other presentations, but it's okay to think of telestial, terrestrial, and celestial as sort of final judgment kingdoms that one is assigned to as it's taught in DNC 76, right? Mm-hmm. 
But the endowment does something also for us in that it, it identifies that it's also a path of ascension from a telestial through a terrestrial and into the celestial. And this is a unique doctrinal perspective that the endowment reveals to us. And it's very powerful to understand this pattern. So I'm not at all undermining this concept of three degrees of glory of judgment, but I am acknowledging and wanting to use moving forward through all of our, all of our presentations are going to be using this fundamental pattern because this is the most useful thing I've ever, ever begun to understand of understanding doctrine, ascension, covenants, every aspect of the gospel can be enlightened through understanding it in terms of this fundamental pattern of telestial, terrestrial, celestial. Yeah, well. So let's jump to what you brought up earlier. In Nephi's dream and Lehi, so let's collapse both of them together, okay? They see a great and spacious building. They have those who are seeking to obtain the path right? I think Lehi says that. They have an iron rod and a straight and narrow path. They traverse the iron rod and they partake of the fruit of the tree of life. Ooh, which that is was the a presence great. of the Lord. That's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so Nephi and Lehi's dreams are endowments. They're ascending the mount into the tree of life, like we've been talking about this whole time. Now, the doctrine of Christ, as taught in 2 Nephi chapters 31 through 33, is Nephi giving us a doctrinal explanation of Lehi and Nephi's dreams or visions. Okay, it's really interesting to think of it that way. He's teaching the doctrine of those visions. And they have a, a wide path that leadeth the broad path that just leads to the destruction, right? Until you come to the gate. And you are receive a baptism of fire and Holy Ghost that we read about in 2 Nephi 31. Then you're on this path, a straight and narrow path, which leads to the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit of promise, the calling and election made sure. So the doctrine of Christ comprehends every aspect of being called, elect, and made sure. So people say, well, we don't need to focus on the calling election made sure. We just need to focus on the doctrine of Christ. They don't, they don't understand that the full thing is the process of one's calling and election made sure. I mean, the, it, it literally says that you endure to the end until the Lord says you will have et eternal life in those verses in chapter 31. Exactly. Exactly. And he will say unto you, ye shall have eternal life. That is the calling and election made sure. Exactly. The temple endowment rehearses the same pattern. You start in the telestial world, the lone and dreary world, considering yourself Adam and Eve. That's the ironic order is in the telestial world. Then you move through into the terrestrial world. That crossover is becoming the new creature in Christ, obtaining the first comforter, becoming born again. Then you are clothed in the holy priesthood preparatory, Melchizedek priesthood, preparatory to officiating in the ordinance as the Melchizedek priesthood in the terrestrial kingdom. In your endowment, you're going to make other covenants in this kingdom that are going to sort of mark the path that one traverses until they come to the veil of the temple, which is the second comforter. And then they are then prepared to move on to other ordinances to obtain that fullness of the priesthood in your path and your path moving towards and obtaining the holy of holies or that overlap of heaven and earth. So this is your temple endowment that we're getting you ready for. <laughs> yeah, that's also, uh, I, I don't think this is like an official thing. But I've heard people like describe the different rooms that you go through, like, you know, there's the celestial room. And then people say like, the, if they don't, not all temples do multiple rooms, some have to do only two, but I know right. some do three and they, they call it like the telestial, terrestrial, and then the celestial room. That's right. Yeah, different temples will kind of map it differently. 
But um, even if you don't move rooms, what they do is they turn the lights on when you go to the terrestrial. They'll turn the lights oh. on brighter to represent it. So now when you go through it, you're going to be looking for all these elements. And then you're going to receive things that, you know, because of covenant, we don't talk about until you, you know, except in the temple. But that's the overall pattern. So, chance, what is the temple inbound? It's a priesthood endowment. It's where you obtain the oath and covenant of the priesthood. It's where you obtain the pattern and you're invited into that same structure. You're called in the ironic. In the terrestrial, you become chosen or elect when you become born again. That's when you are chosen or elect. And then as you exercise faith, and diligence and endure in that elect state, you can obtain the promises of sealing or having that election made sure. Men and women go through this both together. It's a pattern in the same way like an order would be like a medical school, okay? Like, when you go to medical school and you get your acceptance letter and they say, show up, you know, September 3rd <laughs> for school, that doesn't mean that you are a doctor, right? Nope. You're just called. Nope. You're invited into the medical order. Now, as you show up, take the classes, the tests, the boards, the rotations, and all the things that go into becoming a doctor, you traverse through that obtaining the knowledge and the preparatory experiences and the skills and all, the, all of that goes into it until you finally become a doctor. And the same kind of idea is behind becoming a high priest. You go through a calling, an election to have it sealed. You're initiated as a high priest in the temple. You become sanctified in the Holy Ghost. You perform sacrifices. You increase in knowledge and you live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God to become anointed and called up to be a high priest or a priestess. So you're going to start your priesthood endowment with an initiatory. It's an initiation into this order. Okay. You need to think of the endowment, not as just the endowment portion or the presentation, but it begins in the initiatory and it ends with the, or it's completed with the second anointing, which is something that we rarely talk about. But the every ordinance of the temple from initiatory to second anointing, you know, comprehending marriage sealing and the fullness of the endowment that you receive, all of that is the endowment, okay? And it's mm -hmm. book ended with an initiatory um, with a ritual washing and anointing and a sealing of that washing and anointing in the second anointing. So in the initiatory portion, both men and women are being initiated into the priesthood order. See that? Yeah. That's what the initiatory is. It's initiation into the priesthood order. You're going to be washed, anointed, clothed in the garment of the holy priesthood, which I'm very excited to talk to you about once you go through. Okay? Cool. Men are, in, are additionally ordained as part of their initiation. And there's a reason for men having ordained to priesthood offices, and it has to do with their covenantal responsibility to come clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Women are declared clean. Men are called to become clean. There's a difference. In the initiation of the priesthood or the initiatory, we are called. Brigham Young says, now, brethren, the man that honors his priesthood and the woman that honors her priesthood will receive an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of God. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. That's... So we're initiated and ordained men and women in the celestial world, so to speak. We have to go through the full process of fulfilling the doctrine of Christ, because the fulfilling of the doctrine of Christ is the exact same thing as obtaining priesthood. 
okay? It's the same thing. When you fulfill the doctrine of Christ, you are fulfilling the order of the priesthood and becoming a priest or a priestess. So back to the temple. On the left and on the right, we're going to show the covenants and ordinances that you go through in the endowment. You start in the telestial. Remember that the telestial, we represent the lesser priesthood with the dotted line. That's the forms, yeah. right? Yeah. So in the telestial kingdom, we receive our initiatory um, washing and, and anointing and baptism in the telestial kingdom, right? That's, an, that's Those are ironic priesthood ordinances. As we move into the terrestrial, we receive confirmation and the gift of the Holy Ghost, Melchizedek ordination, temple endowment, fulfillment, the veil of the temple, eternal marriage, and second anointing. So those are the forms that we go through and practice in the endowment. And in reality, you see, in the telestial portion, that's ironic. So we don't have a spiritual aspect of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But when you move into the terrestrial and you obtain the spiritual aspect of it, the confirmation corollary is to become born again, a new creature in Christ. That's the entrance point. Once you do that, then you begin to exercise what we call priesthood power or the power of the Holy Ghost through the fulfillment of the doctrine of Christ in order of the priesthood. That's another conversation we'll have a lot. <laughs> the temple endowment is just fulfilling that holy pattern, which is fulfilled when you receive the calling and election made sure in the different dimensions that we obtain it. That's another conversation as well. Second comforter, you receive the calling and election made sure of your marriage and the fullness of the priesthood by God's own voice in the fulfillment of Genesis 14 JST, which we read previously. Mm -hmm. So the forms are on the left. The power of godliness is when we fulfill those forms. You see? Yeah, wow. Now, if you have the forms, which means you're called, and if you're fulfilling the power of godliness and you move through, then you can receive, um, you can be sealed because you received all of the power of godliness associated with those ordinance and those forms. But if you receive the forms and you do not obtain the power of godliness of those ordinances, that is what it means to be condemned or be in a state of condemnation. Okay. So in DNC 84, when Joseph Smith reveals that they were in a state of condemnation, it's because they'd received the forms and the invitations, but they had not gone from the form to the power of godliness and obtained the spiritual manifestations of those ordinances. They did not receive or obtain the fullness of the presence of Jesus Christ as a collective people. And it was, they were invited to do so very early in the restoration. That's why Joseph Smith says, how many will be able to abide a celestial law and go through and receive their exaltation? I am unable to say as many are called, but few are chosen. So very few go from being called from the forms into a chosen state of being born again and exercising the power of godliness. So we must become high priests and priestesses. We do so by fulfilling the holy order and the holy pattern, each one of us as individuals. This is obtaining Zion. This is fulfilling the patterns of the prophets given to us in the scriptures. This is to receive the fullness of the priesthood, the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the Holy Ghost, to make our callings and elections made sure. This is what it means to ascend into the church of the firstborn. Receiving priesthood is the process of ascension. Receiving priesthood or the fulfilling the order of the priesthood is how Zion is literally built. 
We fulfill the holy order when we fulfill the pattern of becoming a high priest and priestess. This is our great calling. So this concludes the introduction of priesthood in, again, summarizing a high-level view of that priesthood as an order or a pattern that we fulfill of the doctrine of Christ, receiving a fullness of the presence of the Lord, a full consummation of that relationship, obtaining the tree of life, and reestablishing it on earth through this new and everlasting covenant. And that concludes the introduction. Thanks, Chance. Yeah, thanks. I learned a lot. <laughs>